Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's really wonderful to be here with so many uh, friends uh, of ours, friends of CAP. Uh, really excited to be able to follow my great friend uh, Bernie on stage and uh, to provide you with a very short introduction uh, to what is going to be a fantastic panel on the epidemic of gun violence in this country. Ryan and Dewan and uh, Karen are going to be out here uh, in about three minutes. Uh, so uh, thank you for sticking around for this really important discussion. Um, I want to start just by telling you a little story. Uh, from uh, about 30 days ago. Uh, I've got two young boys. I've got a, a nine-year-old and I've got a six-year-old kindergartner. Um, six-year-old kindergartner came home from school uh, on a Friday afternoon. He goes to a big public school with about 25 kids in his kindergarten class and he described to me what he had gone through that day. He had been through his first active shooter drill as a six-year-old. And in his kindergarten classroom, they have their own bathroom. And so what they did was take all 25 children and push them into that bathroom, standing like sardines, shoulder to shoulders with their hands tight to their chest, silent for five minutes until the door opened again. And some of those kids knew what that was about, like my son. Some of the other kids might not have known exactly what they were doing. But he came home that night and he said to me, Daddy, I did not like that. And it occurred to me as I'm literally welling up with tears listening to him that I have watched for 20 years as the gun industry and the gun lobby has co-opted these ideas of, of freedom and liberty to personify the, the nature of their cause, the unlimited right of gun ownership. And, and at that moment, for those five minutes inside that classroom, my six-year-old had never had less freedom or less liberty than at any other point in his short life. And therein lies the key to our success. Taking these concepts, right, that have been the foundation of the argument for the gun lobby and appropriating them for ourselves. This issue of gun violence, it's so unique in the American political conversation today, right? Because it's not as if we are convincing people of what the right thing to do is. We've won the argument, 90% of Americans think that we should have universal background checks. Today, 67% of Americans, two-thirds of Americans, think that we should regulate the purchase and sale of assault weapons. We're also not suffering from a lack of research. We know what works and what doesn't. States that have universal background checks have 35% lower rates of gun violence than states that don't. States like mine that have tough gun laws have 400% lower rates of gun violence than the states that have the loosest gun laws, like Florida. It's not a question of whether we've won the persuasion argument. It's not a question of not knowing what to do. It is a question of intensity. It is a lack of voters who put gun violence at the top of their list of issues when they are choosing between candidates. And the good news that we have to share today is that that gap in intensity is closing. Let's just take a look at the results from uh, the Virginia uh, elections last fall. Uh, guns was number two behind health care in terms of the issues that they cared most about. A poll from a few weeks ago confirms that as voters are thinking about their issues for the upcoming election. And our challenge that I hope we discuss today is uh, how to make sure that these moments when we have uh, available to us to increase voters intensity are not just limited to the mass shootings. Right? How do we talk to people about the daily reality of trauma that happens in our cities today? How do we describe to people the fact that studies suggest that kids who are growing up in places like Baltimore or the north end of Hartford or the east end of Bridgeport have rates of PTSD that are greater than soldiers that are returning from combat? You or I may intersect with a flight or flight moment uh, presented with a danger that is so significant that we have only two options, to fight or to flee, maybe once or twice in our lives. But these kids, these kids face that every single day. And what happens is their brains become bathed in these hormones called cortisol, corrupting their circuitry. It's no coincidence that all the underperforming schools are in the most dangerous neighborhoods. Gun violence is a public health epidemic. We're losing a generation of kids. And so this is our challenge before us. We 
are winning this fight day by day, thanks to the Parkland students, thanks to the, thanks to the gun groups, to CAP, uh, and so many others. We are closing that intensity gap day by day by day. But we have to make sure that we have the ability to make that argument 365 days a year, not just when the TV news is full of stories about Sandy Hook or Aurora or Parkland. So I'm really excited to be part of this panel today. I will get out of the way. I have said that uh, from the beginning, um, democracy just doesn't allow for 90% of Americans to not get their way for very long. If we work hard enough, uh, it is just uh, a matter of time. Uh, so thank you very much. I look forward to the panel. Joining Senator Murphy on stage, please welcome Ryan Deitch, Dewan Patterson, and moderator Karen Tumulty. This is such an honor to, uh, to be here, to, to talk to all of you about this from all your different perspectives. Um, but I think I wanted to start out asking Ryan a question. Uh, right after the shooting, there, there was a CNN town hall and a really emotional exchange between you and Senator Rubio where you said, why are we the ones who have to march? But there was something else that you said. You said that you felt like you were on the first step of a 5K race. It's been three months. We've seen the, this extraordinary marches and so much action. Where do you feel like you are now in this 5K race? Uh, well, I, I feel like we have taken some leaps and bounds. I mean, as we see all the states that have passed legislation that has benefited their own people and their own constituents, that's been amazing. But at the same time, this, this isn't a 5K race. This is definitely several marathons <laughs> that are consecutively running all at once. And we, we have so much to do, so, so many things that we can do at all levels that as I learn more about uh, education reform that needs to be done, uh, the mental health spending in our country, that how the state of Florida alone on mental health is uh, 50th out of 50 states. <laughs> and uh, that's just disgraceful in its own right and that the gap between 49 and 50 in mental health spending is worse than the gap between 49 and one. So just, just to see that it's double the worst in mental health spending, that we, we have to fix that. We have to fix things at the local level, uh, the, state, the state's rights on preemption, on how local leaders cannot enforce these legislations that, I mean, uh, Mayor, Mayor Gillum of Tallahassee alone uh, fought the NRA in court to uphold a law that he himself didn't enact, but he just enforced, and he was sued as an individual that is legal in the state of Florida. That's something that we have to fix. There's just so many issues, and then just going on the federal level of gun violence, we, there, there's just so much more that we can do since so much legislation has yet to be passed. It's just, there's so many sitting on the shelves that is just so easy to just enact yesterday that it could save countless lives that we should just get to work. And did you expect things to move faster to, that the whole country was so shocked that, did you expect more action than we've been seeing? I, I expected uh, more action from those who haven't done anything thus far. There, there are still countless representatives that have no public stance on these issues of gun violence and to, to see some of them actually put out a statement saying that I will not stand for this or to say that uh, I stand uh, against anything that these kids are saying that to, to see e even just that reaction made, made me feel like things would happen faster since I mean uh, just the disapproval rate of Congress is just awful <laughs> to, to, to see it even less than 50% that America doesn't feel like Congress is doing the job that they could be doing. And I, I feel like they can be doing that job as long as they actually get to it and start listening to the American people as, I mean, certain things like, as uh, S Senator Murphy has said, with uh, un universal background checks are just 97% uh, of Americans pretty much more or less support it. And if 97% of people support something and Congress hasn't moved on it, it just shows you where our country is heading. <laughs> Um, Dewan, I don't know that everyone in the audience knows your story, so I'm going to tell it briefly. 
Uh, in 2005, you were a victim of a robbery, and you were, you're a survivor of gun violence. You were shot in the head. Um, but the first thing that you saw the fir after hearing this shot was you look up and you see a bunch of police officers with their guns pointed at you. Could you talk, I mean, a lot of years have gone by, thank God you are here with us today, physically healthy, but you were telling me backstage that, you know, there are parts of you that just don't heal that fast. Could you talk a little bit about that, what it's like to be a survivor of gun violence this far out? <clears throat> thank you for um, briefly talking about my story of what brought me to this point. Um, as we was mentioning backstage, there is something about gun violence survivors that we tend to forget about because we overlook the, the invisible scars. Now we have some physical scars that we see and we make the assumption that um, physically they are healthy and mobile. Uh, however, there are some scars that um, go beyond and meets the eye. Talking about their reoccurrence, exposure to trauma, um, reactivating some of those um, traumatic experiences when I'm experiencing um, the exposure on TV from mass shootings, but oftentimes we're forgetting about the shootings that do not reach uh, mass media and the news that every day youth like, such as myself and younger are facing, and they're facing it on such a reoccurring base that it won't have an opportunity to turn off that fight or flight um, response in our mind, and we're always thinking about fight, and um, that actually evokes a, a hyperactive cognitive processing. And that may be perpetuating some of the violence that's happening in urban communities. And we're never asking the question about how do we support gun violence uh, survivors? Where's the mental health support services, the wraparound services after they leave the hospital? Those type of discussions and policies are not being implemented or highly promoted, and we're not seeing um, how we can use that to really impact gun violence and a level of prevention. So I, I wanted to make sure that we, we bring up that point. And, and one of the things that you have done, that you have devoted much of your life since then too, is sort of as a first step, getting people in the community to talk to each other honestly, openly. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, one, this particular initiative is called Be More Family. I'm a Baltimore native, so it's a play on words. So it's Be More Family, and I recognize that if people are seeing themselves as a community, because there's no such thing as community without unity. So if people actually see themselves as a community in unity, they're less likely to participate in gun violence. So what I did was provide a community assessment before we go in a particular neighborhood and um, we assess the needs of the community, then activate that space, provide them with resources such as mental health professionals, legal clinics, uh, financial literacy experts, medical and children, um, uh, uh, dental health service providers, as well as uh, physical nourishment. So these are the type of things that help you to um, be more receptive because now I'm able to nourish your, your physical, now you're receptive on, on the mental level. So having no level of conversation and engagement helps to build the capacity to reduce uh, gun violence and, and allows the community to see the solutions and they be able to engage some of their public officials. So with these particular um, affairs, I have uh, elected officials come in and talk to um, the community and we are able to impose some solutions and policies from that standpoint. And Senator, you had talked about the, the divide between where public opinion is and where legislative action is. Do you feel like it has changed at all? And why is this divide where you have all these issues where you know public opinion is in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and yet you know, Congress can't act? Why do we have this, this great divide? Well, I, I absolutely do think it's changed, and, and that's just not my anecdotal experience. That's driven by data, which shows you that this uh, is an issue of voting importance to more and more 
uh, Americans, and those numbers that I referred to at the beginning have moved as well. You look at the uh, support ratings for all the interventions that we think will make a difference, and those are at record numbers as well. I mean, the problem has always been twofold. One, it's a question of intensity amongst those that already agree with us, but the second problem is a, a much more difficult one to diagnose, and, and that is um, really a story of the modern Republican Party. The, the modern Republican Party, I would argue, has essentially lost any connection to real new ideas. Their only idea is less government. And so if you are trying to um, out anti-government, uh, another Republican in an electoral contest, then the NRA's imprimatur, their um, endorsement is the most important because who's more anti-government than the organization that argues for the armed insurrection of the people against government? And so over time, um, the, um, the badge that is provided to Republicans by the uh, gun lobby has become more and more and more important. Um, and so that is a problem that, that, that I am probably not going to be able to solve, but I can solve the other one, and that question of intensity, which uh, you know, eventually will simply just change the composition of elected bodies, um, is, is, is probably on the verge of, uh, of happening. So tell us, you have spent, uh, Ryan, a little bit of the last couple of days back on the Hill, uh, and specifically in some Republican congressional offices that we're not here to be partisan, but could you talk a little bit about kind of the, the environment as you sense it and kind of the, the attitudes as, as you are feeling them now? Do you feel like the attention and the intensity has died down at all? Uh, well. I definitely feel like the, the intensity in certain areas has died down. P people don't like to focus on an issue that is uh, so looming that, I, I mean, the, the issue of gun violence can affect anyone, anywhere, at any time. And if you let that sink into anybody's mindset, they, they won't want to hold on to that for too long. And I don't blame anybody for that. I don't want to think about that at any moment. But uh, de de definitely with the people that I met and the people that we got to speak with, uh, they they were trying to throw around, there was definitely some misinformation going around about how uh, they, they like to say organizations like where I'm working with March for Our Lives that we are against the Second Amendment, which is just simply not true. That we are for uh, common sense regulations on weaponry to make sure that the uh, cr criminals of this country would be stopped from having these weapons. And that they say that we are attacking law-abiding citizens, which is simply not the case. I, I mean, the, the last time I checked, asking someone to fill out an extra form doesn't attack your freedoms. But uh, si simply, with, with all the lawmakers that we did get to meet, uh, they, they were saying things like uh, reforming mental health in this country. And while they would push that instead of the gun violence issue, they would also not really have a fair enough solution to mental health crisis in this country. And I could say simply if we would fund uh, centers when we would need to and if we could potentially offer uh, assistance in schools, especially at the youngest levels, since many people in this country go undiagnosed with any mental health disabilities or men and any mental health issues. And especially we have to separate the idea that if somebody has any mental health disabilities, then they are also a dangerous individual, which is not the case that pe people say that, I, I mean, I, I know many people with various disabilities of uh, autism, and they are not dangerous individuals. They might have issues communicating, but they are not a dangerous individual to a mass public. And we, we have to make sure that those lines are drawn when these conversations happen, which a lot of representatives in Congress do not draw those lines. They just say mental health and put up a wall. And that's not something that we need to do. We need to break down those walls. We need to sit down at the table instead of throwing chairs. And that's just something that I see with a lot of the partisan nature of politics. And I hope that the future generations are able to break down those barriers because simply not having these conversations is detrimental to everybody. And talk a little bit about, Speaking of future generations, talk a little bit about how you plan to spend this summer between your uh, junior and senior years. Well, uh, for, first off, I, I sadly am not going to college in the fall. I am going to be working on the uh, midterm elections, trying to make sure that the youth vote is moving. Uh, 
be because si si simply the, the voter turnout for America's youth is roughly about one in five, and that just isn't acceptable. That, that the fact that, uh, th for, for the most part, the youth are ignored in this country, that the issues that we face are not brought up in Congress, the issues that we face are not brought up in the government day by day, and uh, the, there are several issues that affect all of us, that affect every American, and gun violence is definitely one of those big issues that it's in our schools, it's in our movie theaters, it's in our churches, it's in our waffle houses, that we just need to combat it as a whole and not take just any one issue that as long as for the, the summer our plans are, we're going to be touring around the country, we're going to do uh, voter registration, voter education, and uh, gun violence will be a key issue that we talk about, but we will talk about other issues that other communities face. That we need to make sure that every community feels that they are being represented because they should be represented. That we, <laughs> thank you for the clapping. <laughs> Just, uh, just, we, we need to make sure that the youth are being heard because the, the moment that that number goes from one out of five to say three out of five, the youth of this country will control every single election to come. And as long as we can get those numbers out to the polls, then every lawmaker who doesn't listen to us now sure will listen to us after November. <laughs> Dewan, you kind of touched on this, but um, the Washington Post did a big study of gun violence in schools. And the fact is that the vast, the absolute overwhelming majority of gun violence is not the kind of horrific situation we saw in Parkland. It is something that happens day in and day out and doesn't really make the headlines because it has become almost so routine in much of America. Do you find, particularly you know, in urban settings, do people get frustrated by the fact that this issue kind of comes into everybody's attention when there's some big mass shooting and then, you know, then we don't hear about it for a while? <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, and I will propose a question that could be rhetorical right now. How many national foundations or national organizations have stemmed from urban gun violence that received over $500,000 or more to address gun violence? We probably can't name three. And not to discredit any other movement addressing gun violence, but there are oftentimes uh, days and weeks where gun violence are impacting communities of color and urban communities and they do not receive the level of media exposure each and every day that we have seen in recent times. Um, the March for Our Lives, we had uh, direct support from very similar foundations and organizations that take Baltimore youth from Baltimore to Washington, D.C. to address gun violence and bring about our issues. And it's disheartening for myself and other um, gun violence victims and directly and some of the third party victims of gun violence and not having access to the same level of resources maybe become disheartening and discredited. I mean, disheartening and discouraging at times, but we still have to continue to fight. Um, I wonder the we call a, a veteran of the Generation Progress fight for a future of gun violence. And we have been protesting, demonstrating, lobbying for, uh, for some time now. And if you look around in the urban communities, we are accustomed to crowdsourcing to fight uh, against gun violence and advocacy and lobbying work and stuff like that. So when we leave here, we would like to see uh, a deeper level of concern and support where we build alliances, where um, we see uh, Parkland survivors who have used their power and privilege to uplift some of the other gun violence survivors. And I think that's something that we continue, we need to continue to do. And, um, and, use, and my last point is that there's more than one way to address gun violence beyond gun ownership. We can, we can pass gun control, we can pass bunch stops like have we done in, um, in Maryland. However, we can, we can use community reinvestment and empowerment to really bring about gun solutions across the board from rural environments to urban environments. We can really do this to get together to really provide co uh, cohesive, real approaches that really address a lot of our needs going beyond gun control, a level of empowerment, and providing economical um, opportunities. So, 
so Senator, when you talk about the two sides being different because of their intensity, um, when, when you listen to, you know, DeWan, it's also, there's a difference between the NRA and the gun control advocates in focus. I mean, the, the NRA never stops paying attention to this issue. Um, what does it take to get that kind of focus on the other side as well? Well, I think it's happening. I, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're watching it happen in real time. I mean, the fact that, um, I, you know, I don't know how many Twitter followers you have, but I know that Emma had more Twitter followers than the NRA did in two weeks. Um, she had outpaced them. And so I think you are, you are watching um, that gap close, um, but we still don't have uh, as many activists. We still don't have uh, as much money, um, and we still don't have that sort of uh, yeah, test for purity on our side that too often happens uh, on the other side. But again, I think it's a matter of time, and that's why I love the fact that we're talking about this in terms of marathons. Um, you know, what we know is that every great social change movement in this country um, is defined not by its ultimate success, but by its failures, by the fact that it, 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 it didn't succeed overnight. Um, and um, what I'm so galvanized by is that we've had plenty of failures, right? We haven't passed anything in the United States Congress that's meaningful, and yet we continue to have more and more and more people join our cause. The other thing I know is that every great social change movement that did succeed and that did overcome the status quo um, had young people at the front of it, whether it was the civil rights movement or the uh, marriage equality movement or the anti-war movement, and now we have young people at the front of our movement uh, as well. Um, and so I see these signs, the, these signs of sustainment, these signs of a change in demographic composition um, that tells me uh, that we ultimately win. And the fact that we now um, have, be have gotten very good at pushing back against these red herrings, right? These red herrings that, well, you just need to focus on mental health or you just need to focus on making sure that people get along. Um, no, there is no connection globally between uh, mental health and gun violence. We have no more mental health than any other country in the world. There are plenty of neighborhoods all around the world that are very, very poor and have non-existent rates of gun violence. What is different in this country is that we have more guns than people. What is different in this country is that certain neighborhoods are awash in weapons and that people have access to dangerous military style weaponry that can kill 20 people in three minutes. And so I think I also get um, confidence that we are, we are becoming much better at engaging in what used to be these really difficult arguments with people on the other side who seem to always know more than us and have better arguments. Um, we've always had better arguments and now we have literally millions of people around the country who are equipped to make them in every single setting. And, but traditionally, you know, it, it's true. Midterm elections, young people just simply don't turn up and vote. So how do you deal with that problem? Well, these guys are gonna have something to say about that, right? Um, and if you, if you look right now at interest in voting in the 2018 elections, um, and you break it down by generation, um, the chart sort of looks like this. Every generation is more interested in voting in 2018 than they were in 2014 or in 2010. But there's one line that doesn't do this, that does this. And that's the 18 to 30 year olds. Now, they're starting from a lower place, um, but already they are showing um, a greater vector between their previous interest and their current interest than any other demographic uh, group. And that's not just good news for the issue of gun violence, that's good news for the previous panel, climate change, because on so many questions, it's the young generation that is. Uh, that has made up their mind. So um, I think they're gonna have to do the work. Um, unfortunately, I, I am what passes for young in the United States Senate. So um, I am not going to be the emissary to 18 to 25 year olds, these guys are. And uh, they're just the tip of the iceberg. There is gonna be a massive movement of young people um, out there doing voter registration, doing turnout from now until election day. And is this something, I mean, again, as you said, it's a marathon. Um, I mean, is this going to, do you think, galvanize your generation so that this is still, I mean, you're going to be working on this now, but also when you're 30 and 40 and 50. Um, do you really get the sense that so, so, so you I will just, be 30 or 40 or 50 someday, just uh, FYI? It, it's just hard for me to think of what tomorrow looks like, to think 30 years ahead. It just, uh, I, I mean, this, this to me feels like a, a turning point. 
It de definitely be as there, there are so many things that, uh, first off, we're taught in school and civics and AP government, like in all these courses that say like, uh, one thing is America is on the side of common sense. And right now I see that our legislators more or less, may, maybe not Senator Murphy, but uh, definitely a great deal of our legislators are not on the side of common sense. I mean, in, in the state of Oklahoma alone, they passed uh, per permitless carry, I believe it was, where you don't need a permit to carry a firearm in public, which just sounds unsafe. Doesn't really sound like it helps anybody. But uh, de definitely this is a turning point moment for uh, our generation and for this country because America's youth uh, just really likes to see results fast. We, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have Snapchat, where it's that instant gratification, which you can argue day and night if it's good or bad. But frankly, we like to see those results and we like to see it fast. And to have a whole uh, just generation of people rise up and say, we want to see results now, I think we're going to see those results way quicker than in the past. <laughs> If I may, real quickly, because yes, we were talking about this, if we were to do a comparison analysis of how responsive um, the age group of 18 to 35 on political issues based on Twitter and in a, the right traditional polling, you'll see that 18 to 25 are more engaged and more responsive to our public figures who are responsive to us and that social media atmosphere. So if we was to actually use that and uh, transform the way we engage our constituents in the public sphere, I think we'll see a difference in our, the way we uh, bring about issues and who our public officials represent us. So it's time we um, catch up to the 21st century. So um, I think we have about five minutes for questions, um, except with the lights here, it's hard for me. There should be people out there somewhere with microphones if anybody has questions that you would like to ask anyone on this panel. There we go. Hi, I'm Haley Plord Cole. I'm from New York. Um, and when I was about your age, um, maybe a little older actually, I was um, stumping around the country for John Kerry and I came down to DC and I met Howard Dean and I remember he was talking about the youth vote and um, I remember asking him then like, how are we gonna really put this into action? How are we really going to turn out young people and take the enthusiasm that was shown on his campaign and and turn it into the general election. So what I'm curious about is going around and talking to young people, are people engaged um, and excited to vote on issues other than just the gun issue? How widespread do you think that is? Um, do you think this is really a turning point in young people voting or is it just that this has become a flashpoint because it's obviously affecting you guys um, in the schools? And I'm very curious about well, that. Well, uh, I mean, I'd just say to that, the, the issue of gun violence has existed for a long amount of time. This didn't just start yesterday. I mean, uh, with, with his incident, that was 13 years ago, that th this is still a running issue in our country and that it wouldn't just be a flash in the pan type issue like with a particular candidate who when they disappear, their base also disappears, where uh, the issue of gun violence and just the issue of the youth getting heard in general. Like once, if we can prove in the midterm elections that you have to listen to the American youth to actually gain support in your constituency, if we can prove that in this midterm election or in the next couple of elections, then it will continue to perpetuate and this age demographic will actually be listened to far more than just the issue of gun violence and just the issue of school shootings. I, I just, I thought Dewan made a great point, which is sort of a, you know, Dewan said, listen, you gotta talk to us. And the fact of the matter is, is this great Tip O'Neill story from back in the day where his neighbor doesn't vote for him and he asks why, and his neighbor who sees him every single day says, well, Tip, you didn't ask. And the fact of the matter is, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy where young people don't vote and then we don't talk to young people because they don't vote and then they don't vote and then we don't talk to them. And so if you wanna engage young people, then we gotta be A, in the space that you are, right? Communicating the same platforms in the same places and actually asking for your vote not just assuming that these set of issues are gonna, uh, are gonna result in new waves of young people coming out. Yeah, and the gun lobby is talking to its voters constantly. I mean, it's got a, a real connection that sort of never wavers. So, 
Anyway, are there any other questions? Oh, here we go. Okay, yeah, thanks. I'm Jane Whitney from Connecticut. Senator Murphy is my senator. Hi, Jane. Hi there. <laughs> Not an audience plant. Ask her for her vote. <laughs> he already has. Um, I want to ask Senator Murphy the, the flip side of this, which is we, a lot of us detected that there was a definite change after Parkland. It was palpable. We could feel that maybe this time would be different. How would you characterize the point of view in the Senate among your colleagues? Do they sense that this time is different or has that moment passed for them and they're just basically ducking and covering at this point? So, I, you know, I, I think that Orlando in many ways was a, was a before and after moment and Parkland is a different version. Uh, of it, but the numbers really started to move around uh, around Orlando, and it's unfortunate that we have to wait for these mass tragedies for people to think differently. Um, and I know this is not a political conference, so I'll just be careful about how I answer your question, Jane. The short answer is yes. Uh, Republicans know that everything is different right now, and they know for the first time that they are fundamentally mispositioned on this issue, and they know that it may actually cost them for the first time ever in an election in 2018. But they, as I mentioned before, have this sort of genetic attachment to this lobby and to this industry um, that they simply can't break until they are forced to. And it will be an election. Um, and it will be the post-mortem on that election in which they try to understand why they lost all of these seats in these kinds of districts um, that will finally cause them to make that break. And my hope is that that is this election. Um, maybe it's 2020, but it is never going to be um, a cataclysmic mass shooting that ultimately breaks that party from the lobby. It is going to be a recognition that their political survival ultimately depends on them getting right. And as I said, um, we are frankly, we are further along than I thought we would be. Um, I thought this was gonna be a 10 year fight coming out of uh, Sandy Hook. We are now in year five uh, and we may be at that point where Republicans see that electoral exposure in a way that they've never seen it before. Thank you very much, and we are out of time, but I want to thank all of you guys, and especially you two, for sharing your stories and, and showing your courage. Thank you so much. Thank you.